find someone to. No, that's that's perfectly all right. I'll I'll move around a little bit. I'll try to. Is is the does the frame catch pretty much to the edge of the? Uh, yes. If if that's if that's good. Um. So I do have a whiteboard. So if you guys do ask questions and I know an answer that will be suited to to draw a diagram, we'll we'll totally do that. Okay. Cool. So my name is Holmes Fenner. Um. This is called Hybrid Home Lab, which is a lame title for what we actually are doing here. The whole point of this is, I think most of us at some point have run a VM, but there's a couple things that you run into with VMs, and one of them is we tend to screw them up pretty quickly, and then you want to get to that consistent starting point again, right? So you break it, you want to start over. And for a lot of people, that can be things like snapshots, um, but that can get a little that can get a little heavy to do, and that can also be a little bit of a problem because not everything is really snapshotable. There are things that depend on time. Like, so Microsoft Windows, for example, if you just decide that you're going to snapshot Windows and it's in an evaluation period, right, it's good to figure out that the time is wrong and then you're going to have to start playing games with the time to keep it from not thinking the time is wrong. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to just building. Uh, please, please come in. You're more welcome to find out if I was supposed to be going recording from here or the other room. So, okay. So, so I'm going to be here and running back and forth. Because I don't think we've, we've lost our other video person. Sweet. So, so basically the idea here is one, how can you introduce automation to something like VMware Workstation or VirtualBox? And there are people that have solved this problem before. And then the other thing is, what if you want to run a lot of stuff, but you don't need it constantly running, right? Well, so, so let's say that you're getting out there and you're like, I want to practice enumerating a network. I want to get in, I want to practice pivoting, cutting through this network that might have you know, 50 different hosts that I can get into. Or I want us to deploy specific vulnerable hosts to hide among those uh, machines that you've just built. So how can you do that in a fairly rapid, repeatable environment? And so most of the people I've seen approach this problem so far have decided to charge an awful lot of money for it. And, and I think there's some really, really good open source tools. We are not, I'm not as far along with this as I would like to be, but I will show you a bunch of stuff I'm working on as I go that direction. If you find that you have a particular use case, there's going to be a lot of time for you to sit down and say, hey, you know, this is actually what I'm trying to do. So I expect we'll, we had a talk last year with Adam Vincent about Ansible, and we had the game thing. We had people taking notes. We had people that were trying to do things that we weren't even talking about, but that we knew a little bit about. We had one lady that was extremely worried because Firefox had just been upgraded, and um, no script didn't work anymore because it was a new quantum, and that was one of the plugins they hadn't updated yet. And so I get out of a machine, it's a Windows 7 machine that hasn't been patched in four years. Oh. Right? So it's a good learning experience, and it's, I, I just never know what I'm going to get. So um, we will have plenty of time to, I'll talk at you for a while, well, then we'll have some breaks and some lab time, and then definitely towards the end as we get to lunch, it'll just mostly be focused on what are you specifically trying to do, is there something I can teach or help or, uh, or work with or even learn from. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys know Parkinson's laws? If you were at the if you were at the uh, morning keynote yesterday, she mentioned it. It's really cool. Uh, Parkinson's law says that work will expand if at the time available. And so I started this like two months ago. And oh oh boy, did I do things that had absolutely nothing to do with this presentation. So there was at one point in this process, I had just decided to do what I thought would be a simple update to my system, ended up reinstalling the whole system because my graphics got all wonky on, the, on Fedora. And so that was eight hours of my day that I can't get back. Let's see if we can, here we go. Okay, so so what this is, uh, what this is, I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff out there. You may have heard of it, you may have not. If you have heard of it, please allow your attention to want it freely. If you haven't heard of it, please ask questions, right? Like I'll, I'll tell you everything I know. And I'll tell you where I'd go or how I might phrase a question to Google, um, because your Google gets better the better you know how to ask the question. Um, what this is, uh, what this is not supposed to do, is show you how to do everything in every possible configuration. So if you have something going on with you, I will totally work through you. But I'll tell you, I'm not a Windows guy first and foremost. So if you are using Windows, um, we might have to learn stuff together. But the the installation guides are really pretty good, and I found that when I got into the how do you install stuff. I had like 29 slides on every possible, hey, well, this might happen while you try to install, that might happen while you try to install. Um, and that wasn't really the point of what I was trying to do. Okay, 
So dream, I firmly believe, is another word for scope creep. And the whole point of this is to basically be able to sit down and say, hey, um, I'm here for the next four hours. I want to do X, Y, and Z. And I found a way to get access to some systems. So how can I make sure that I can deploy that environment and actually come what I came, do what I came to do rather than sit there and figure out how to build a lab? So I think anytime you ever see somebody put together a CTF, there's a lot of time up front in building that CTF. And the more you can automate, the more you can actually concentrate on the, the fun stuff, which is breaking boxes, defecting boxes, building flags, um, the stuff you actually came to do. And what I've found out whenever I've tried to build a lab is that's exactly my problem. I spent so much time on the back end trying to build the stuff that I never really get to the fun parts that I was actually there to do. So why would I use cloud in this? So, so cloud, you know how everybody gets out there and say, hey, cloud's going to save you money. So, so the, the, problem, the problem with the cloud is that it really will save you money, but not if you try to use it the same way that you try to use regular bare metal. Because in a regular data center, you're already paying for the power. You're already paying for the cooling. You're already paying for the life cycle of that machine. So it makes sense to run things 24-7. Use as much of that capacity as you can. And that's actually where virtualization comes from to begin with, right? Because we figured out we had these huge data centers that mostly didn't use all the capacity they had. So how could we compress that stuff onto to the bigger machines and make sure that they could run as efficiently as possible? So cloud takes it a step further and just says, all right, well, you also probably don't need to run everything 24-7, right? So as we've gotten better with that automation piece, we've gotten better at figuring out, all right, when do we actually need a service available? And so you'll see some data centers where those services will follow the sun around the globe. I just don't need as many web servers at 2 in the morning in North America. So maybe I can scale down, but over in Japan or China, maybe that's their peak time. So let's shift what we're doing over there instead of running exactly as much in both places and paying exactly as much. If you try to do that model and you try to bring that to the cloud, the cloud will not be cheap. It won't even be close. But it also takes a lot of a, also takes a lot of architecture, right? So you do have to consider all those automation things. And then I don't know if you guys have started to follow cloud at all with trends, but one of the things that's happening in cloud right now is something called the edge. I don't know if anybody does this sound familiar to anybody? The edge is basically, hey, if we centralize everything, now we're really, really dependent on the bandwidth and networks. And if you look at the internet, one of the things that sucks about the internet is the internet is not the most efficient network out there. The internet's not designed to be an efficient network. The internet is designed to be a cost efficient network, meaning that I'm going to take the cheapest path to get you data, not the one that gets you there the fastest. And in addition to that, we find that things like Russia and China, where they trick the internet and will bring your traffic across into their world because they want to look at it, right? So if you guys, if you guys look at some of the stuff that's happened recently, they just things they flat out lie to BGP and then it moves traffic all over the world. So one of the counters to all of that is to actually move your compute back out to where you actually need it. So we're moving from that centralized model back into a more decentralized model where somebody might ship you a computer for as long as you need it. So Amazon has one example of this. Um, they call it Snowball. And what you essentially can do is say, hey, I want this environment like your cloud, and they'll ship you out a machine for like 10 days. And if you have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data and you want to do stuff with that, you can actually load it up locally and then ship it back to Amazon. Amazon will plug it back into the data center rather than trying to shove it all over the network. So those, that's the advantage of the cloud, or, and that's the advantage of the edge. And so one of the cool things for the edge for us is the edge kind of fits perfectly into what we're trying to do. We probably don't need a whole data center, but a couple machines that are available locally for an environment like this, that'd be awesome. If I could just have a box sitting right here that is exactly what you'd get in Amazon, but we could all use locally without having to congest the network and go to all those man-intensive applications. That'd be pretty cool. So that's what the edge is. <clears throat> this, is a, this is the bulk of, of what I'm going to talk about right here. Um, so we're going to run over some automation tools and some concepts. I will tell you there's a lot of overlap in all of these tools. A lot of these tools can do really, really similar things. Um, 
it is something that you want to pick based on what's most appropriate to you. You might want to pick Ansible because, you know what, you know Python. You know Python really well. That's what your team uses, and you know you can extend Ansible really well. And that's really cool. And then Vagrant is a Ruby-based application. So maybe, maybe you look at Vagrant and you're like, ah, I don't really have that much experience with Vagrant. So you skip over and you come down to Terraform. They're all kind of based on different technologies. So play to your strengths. What's most appropriate to your team? and what you're trying to solve, and generally speaking, um, that's, that's going to be the direction you want to go. So, if you've never heard of the concept of item potency before, item potency is basically the idea that no matter how many times I run a piece of code over a box, it should not do anything except bring the box into the state that I've defined in that script. So if I say there's supposed to be a web server running on 443 with certain certificates, I should be able to run that script as many times as possible, and what that script essentially will do is figure out how to get me to that state rather than me actually saying, all right, I need you to go out, copy this down, I have to hash it, I need you to make sure that it gets copied down, write a bunch of logic in there. Um, things like Ansible and, or, or uh, Puppet or Chef all work through that for you. They figure out how to get you there, and they'll provide you a module saying, hey, you want this file? Tell me what the file is. Tell me where to go get it. Um, and I will go solve everything else for you. Vagrant was originally developed by a guy named Michael Hashimoto. And so if you, if you guys haven't heard of it, there's a, he's got a corporation called uh, HashiCorp. And a lot of these tools are HashiCorp tools. And so Michael Hashimoto sat down and said, uh, what can I do to give my developers consistent environments that match production as well as, as neatly as possible? Because one of the big problems with developers is they'll work on something They'll get it running on their machine. They pitch it over the wall to Ops, and Ops goes, uh, guys, this doesn't work. And they'll go, well, it works on my machine. And then you have Ops try to figure out how to uh, make those two environments match. And so you get some janky stuff in there. What's cool about Bagger is this is a good time for them to integrate with their Ops, environment, or ops team and actually say, hey, um, go build me a machine that matches production as nicely as possible, and Bagger can build bunches of machines. Build me a machine that matches that production environment as nicely as possible and make sure I can repeat that environment. So as I'm working through my code, I have a stable and consistent environment. And so hopefully what you get back over the wall is something that will actually plug into the real environment rather than just what they've made changes to in the libraries they might have made changes to to make things work. Packer is very cool. Packer will take stuff from an actual ISO or it will take it from a virtual hard drive um, and it will actually build out one of those Vagrant machines or really any disk image you want. So if you've ever used KVM before, they have stuff like Virtustall, does very similar things. Um, what's very, very cool about this is Packer will handle a bunch of different providers. And for that, providers are hypervisors. Um, so you can have it build something for Amazon and for VMware Workstation and for VirtualBox and for Kimu, and for Google Cloud, you can have it build you know, seven or eight different images that all run the same scripts over them. They're all machine imaged to those different platforms. And what's helpful about that is now I can deploy anywhere I want with, without being different. So if you're talking about something like a hybrid cloud, and you want some of your stuff over in Google Cloud, some of your stuff over in Amazon, and some of your stuff on a local OpenStack install, and you want your developers to be able to work on that locally on the machine on VMware Workstation, that's where Packer would shine. So it's basically an approach to all of those systems as opposed to what well, most of the tools we have, which will build one hard drive with one specific type of hypervisor. Terraform is orchestration. It's cloud orchestration. It's very, very similar to what Ansible does. Um, what's cool about Terraform, the uh, difference of Terraform, is that you can tell Terraform, this is everything you need to build in my environment. And Terraform will work through and say, what can I build in parallel? If you define this thing all the way at the end, Ansible will run top to bottom. Terraform will say, hey, this thing you defined at the end of the file doesn't have any other dependencies, so there's no reason I can't go out and provision DNS. But if it's sitting there and saying, you actually haven't provisioned this box, and in order to populate DNS, I need to know what the box IP that doesn't exist yet will be, now it will say, all right, provision this, then run DNS. But if you're doing it against like three or four different high, um, cloud providers, they can all run in parallel. 
So it basically has this dependency graph, and I'm like, get that it'll work back through and say, hey, how can I do this as fast and efficiently as possible? That, and that's what Terraform does. Um, like I said, you can do a lot of the same things you can do in Terraform with Ansible. They're, they're both good solutions. It just depends on the approach you want to take and how much you want to have to teach your ops team. Um, Vault. So Vault approaches something called secrets management. There's also something called Ansible Vault. But Vault is basically, how do I store things like passwords and make them available to systems that are constantly coming up and dying? So what Vault essentially does is say, hey, can I give you permission to use one password? And a good example is something like a root password. So root, <coughs> root is a consistent, pretty much you can, you can have one password. And rather than saying, hey, you have to know that root password and maybe have the same root password everywhere or have to manage how you keep track of that root password, you can spit it in the ball and you can say, hey, this person that just joined the team has permission to reach that uh, vault pad or that root password anytime you want, which means that you can have another piece of automation consistently changing the root password in the background, and that at any given point in time, they know they can reach in the ball and pull out the current root password, you're going to be fine. So you disconnect that, hey, I know what the root password is, and I installed it, and it's a good way to track who used root passwords, because that sometimes is not something we're great at, right? Most systems I've seen, People that know root passwords know root passwords. It's just the way it is. They don't have a really good set of controls. They may say you're not supposed to log in as root, but if a system's truly in well hosed, you probably need to log in as root. So Vault's a good approach to how do I take that. Um, same thing, it can, it can store a bunch of stuff. It can do some very, very cool stuff. Um, SSH keys are a very cool one to me. So there was a, a really, really good talk about that Netflix. Netflix has figured out how to break the internet at various times. Um, they are an extremely interesting automation platform. To use. Um, they have an engineering team that managed to scale and come this side of breaking the internet, and Netflix fired all of them because they needed to figure out how to not break the internet. They said, hey, you guys figured out how to get us this much traffic, and we think you could probably figure out how to make it so we don't break the internet. But we're going to bring in people that know how to not break the internet right this second and they fired them all, and Netflix's policy is if you're that good, you're not going to have trouble finding a job. For the most part, they've been right. It's a very, very different culture. Um, Netflix essentially has an approach to the world that says, we don't expect you to work for us forever. You're going to work here, learn some things, and move on. That's It's it's an interesting culture. It's one you can get away with when you live in an area that is as talent-rich as they are, um, but it's certainly not something that scales to everybody. They came up... I'm sorry, go ahead. Question about the vault. Yeah. Um, so, am I, am I understanding that right? So, you're, you're kind of putting something like, uh, like a solution like KeyPass or something like that and putting logging with it? Is that very, very similar, except when you open a KeyPass vault, you can see everything. Right. With vault, I can be so explicit as to say, you have permission to see the root password from 8 to 5 p.m. for this one box. So I can really define that, and if I have to feed that out to a machine, I can give a machine a password and say, hey, you have permission to know this secret, but not all of the secrets. And then I can also track when you access that. So I know that if I'm constantly rotating my root password, for example, if you know the root password, you had to get in there and access it, which should set off some alarms if somebody's pulling the root password, right? Probably for a completely legitimate reason, but if it wasn't for a legitimate reason, you should know that at 3 in the morning somebody tried to pull it. So that's, that's a, yes, that's, that's ball. Very similar to something like KeyPass or LastPass in the sense of, hey, here's an encrypted store for all my secrets, but it's actually where they make their money is on the access of those secrets. So a good example of secret software, SSH. So, so Netflix comes up with this thing called the Bless Framework. They come up with thing, this thing called the Bless Framework because they saw a case study. And what happened was there was a, there, it's a really good uh, video, it's on YouTube, they uh, found a company, and this company had built all of their infrastructure. And then one of their sysadmins said, I'm taking my ball and going home. And they came in, and wouldn't you know it, all their infrastructure was burned to the ground. So they built their infrastructure again. They had infrastructure as code, they could do that. And they came in the next day, and there's everything burned to the ground again. So now they're calling in an incident response team. The incident response team makes sure they're changing all their SSH keys, doing all the signing yards. They build everything up, and it gets burned to the ground again. 
And what turned out had happened was this sysadmin while he was there had gotten access to one of the other sysadmin's laptops. And he was pulling the SSH key every single time they changed it. It didn't matter how many times they changed it, the, the, the point of failure was going to be that guy's laptop. So what Netflix said was, how do we prevent that from happening to us? How do we give our developers as much latitude and freedom to use the things they want to use, the workflows that will work best for them, while also ensuring that we have some sense of security around this? And so what they came up with is a solution that was SSH certificates. SSH certificates have existed for a very long time. Have you guys all SSH before? I'm sure we've all gotten the thing that says, hey, do you trust this host? That is the SSH equivalent of going to a web page and saying, hey, um, do you really trust that this is Google.com? This is a self-signed certificate. So this thing that we tell everybody, if it's a self-signed certificate, you really got to think about this one. Like, if it's on your local network, you could probably tolerate it. But definitely on the internet, that's, that's uh, Danger Will Robinson. We SSH all the time and just ignore that. So what an SSH certificate does is, and the key difference between a certificate and a key, is that somebody else has assured you by signing the key that they are who they claim to be. And so when you talk about the internet, when you talk about HTTPS, you have that set of root certificates that exist in your browser, and those are people that we theoretically trust. And I cannot emphasize the word theoretically not there. And those are people that we trust to have gone through and validated that a website is really owned by the people that say they own the website. That to varying degrees, some places actually go out and say, do you have a brick and mortar business? And do you have an address? And can you prove with an LLC that you are who you say you are? And that you match to Google.com. So there's varying degrees of, of certificates that you can trust out there. Some are verified all to that level. Some are verified like let's encrypt. And they just say, hey, do you have the ability to change DNS? If you have the ability to change DNS, we're going to assume you are who you say you are. You're certificate. We don't do that in SSH very often, but you can. And one of the cool things about SSH, when you sign a certificate, is now I don't need to put you in my authorized key files, because if the machine trusts the person that signs that, uh, that certificate, then you're going to be able to get in, and they're going to look at it, and they say, you must be this user. The certificate's signed by somebody I trust. You must have all these capabilities, so the certificate is signed by somebody I trust. Um, with SSH certificates, it's very cool. Um, if you've ever looked through the SSH options, you can do a bunch of stuff. On a certificate, I can limit those options. So I can say, you may do this, but you may not forward ports. You may log into the machine, you may not pass through the machine. There's all sorts of things you can do with a certificate, very, very cool stuff. But probably the most important thing that Netflix realized was that certificates would be time limited. And so what Netflix did is they implemented this thing. They said, AWS, we're going to trust you. We're going to trust you to be able to authenticate our users. You go through two-factor authentication. If you're in AWS and you say that you're Holden Vendor, you know what? We're going to trust that AWS verify that. And then we're going to use a Lambda function. And if you want to get to a server, I'm going to issue you an SSH certificate. And I'm going to time limit it to four minutes, meaning you have enough time to log into that server. But if anybody steals it and tries to come in behind you, there is a very narrow window in which they will have to use that. And what they found was that just because your SSH certificate expires doesn't mean that your session will quit. So if I've authenticated into a server, I can start doing SSH work across it, and that's fine. If I need to get in an hour or two later because my, my session breaks down, I go grab another certificate. But I can work for several hours, and this is not an inconvenience to my developers. So what they also did at that same time was build jump boxes, and they basically said, hey, SSH into the jump box with this time limit certificate, and then there's another option you can put an SSH and let you proxy and say every box behind the jump box, I want to SSH through that jump box. So I'm going to use this that first barrier of entry. I'm going to make difficult to get into. And then everything behind that, if you set up SSH right, will be invisible to the, the end user. They're able to get where they need to go. They're able to do the things they need to do. But I've also instituted that security that keeps other people from stealing that key from however perspective. Um, unless they get an AWS and break AWS. Vault will do that exact same thing. So if you wanted to implement a very similar feature, that's a way to do it. Vault will issue certificates, you can have them trusted by all your servers, and, and that's the approach. Service discovery. So console does service discovery. Um, this again is one of those problems that you have when you have stuff constantly living and dying. So 
how do you know how many MySQL servers you have in a given time? If I'm scaling, for example, web servers, the web servers being a really good example, I need 10 web servers during the day because that's the traffic I get. But then as, as things start to dwindle down at night, I only need three web servers. How do I know which three web servers are alive and which, which ones I killed? And how do I bring up the new ones the next day without having to just incorporate a ton of, of pain? So what console actually does is basically say, hey, I'm going to come up, I'm going to run through some health checks, and then I'm going to report into a central place and say, hey, I am ready to go and I am ready to receive traffic. I am healthy. And it's a little bit different. You guys have ever used load balancing, like the F5s, for example? Uh, they definitely have those health checks similarly. But those are, at least as they started those, those were a more manual process to say, hey, I'm just going to go in and tell you which IPs I want to try to traffic off to, or at least which DNS names, however you want to do it. This is nice because it will actually go in however you want to do that load balancing in the background. It'll say, yes, I am ready to receive traffic. And then you can work out how to send stuff. They also do what's called a key value store. So if you want to store um, certain parameters and say that um, pretty much anything you can do with a key value store, you can do with this. So it's just a, hey, if I want to tell you what environment variable to plug in for here, and I want to set it consistently, and I want to say every time you can uh, provision this machine, go out, grab this, and say I'm the MySQL server and the server type environment variable, it can do stuff like that. So it's a, a simplified database, I guess, is a, another way of saying that. The other cool thing that just added was something called a service mesh. So service mesh is starting to kind of take form, especially around containers. And the idea with a service mesh is that same idea that we have with SSH authentication. If I want to make sure I'm really going to the service I'm going to, um, that's one of the, that was one of the selling points of IPsec. IPsec could say, hey, you're going to port 80. So... I don't really have any way to authenticate that's a real server. I just know I'm trusting the network has gotten you to the right port 80 on the right IP. And I'm trusting I'm not being spoofed and that nobody's lying to me in that path. What a service mesh will do, what IPsec tunnels would have done, was to take any arbitrary port and IP and actually put a certificate at the other end that you could handshake with and say, are you who I expected you to be? Are you actually 480? And so you could have secured something like that basic web server that doesn't have HTTPS with a service mesh. Um, we don't really have to worry about with HTTPS, but there's a lot of protocols out there that are just kind of plain text going back and forth. So if you have a way to control how those ports authenticate and talk to each other, that goes a long way. And that puts you in an environment that you can cross between different data centers. So that's console, it's uh, service discovery. Not the only one out there that does it, but again, Nomad is job management. Nomad and Kubernetes are really similar. Um, Nomad is, Nomad's kind of like a cron job on steroids. So it just is a central server that says, hey, um, do you want to go spin out a, spin up a VM? Um, if you've ever worked on a large system that does something called data ingest, like so it's a, let's say it's a, let's say it was Google, let's say it's Google search engine, right? Every single day, Google needs to go out there and crawl the web and figure out what's new, right? So they go out, but we know that those are we know those are jobs that don't exist in perpetuity. They just say, hey, go out, crawl this website tomorrow, crawl this website again. But that's something that no man can do really well is say, hey, every day, go out and crawl this website with this server, and then kill that server off, bring it back the next day when you need it, kill it off, bring it back. Um, that's what Nomad does. So it's, it's something called jobs, and it can just fire stuff off onto random bits of compute and say, go do something, tell me the result, and kill yourself when you're done. Docker. Docker is a very, very, very cool thing. Docker is very different from a VM in that it's based on the kernel of whatever you're wanting. So I struggled with what's the difference between Docker and VM because that was, that was a really hard concept for me when I was first starting to get like VMs made sense to me. They were just computers inside computers. Um, you can treat Docker like that, but that's not really what Docker is. Docker shares the kernel at the bottom level, um, meaning it's not quite as secure as a VM. VMs tend to have a little more, um, a little more secure, a security layer there. But Docker spins up really, really quickly because it doesn't have to start that kernel every single time, and they can also run a really, really limited number of processes in there. So if I start up a web server, 
and it turns out that what's actually vulnerable on that web server is SSH, then I, I still have to tolerate patching SSH everywhere and dealing with that in every web server. If I spin up a Docker container that's a web server, it will literally just run the web server process. And that'll be the only thing that runs in there. So that could be a really nice way of isolating off all your resources. Um, and they also spin up super quick, so they spin up in a couple seconds. And then there's a, there's a lady out there named Jess Frizzell. I love Jess Frizzell. Jess Frizzell has done a ton of really cool things with Docker. She does privileged containers on her desktop, so you can actually, she runs Chrome, for example, in a um, <coughs> Docker container, which is incredibly cool because there's a lot of times that you just want a web browser and you don't want that web browser to exist forever. Like, you, it, the internet's just a dangerous place. So if you're regularly blowing away and re, uh, rebuilding your web browser, that can be a really big advantage. And then finally, Kubernetes. And Kubernetes and Docker Swarm are very similar approaches um, to basically the problem of, hey, I know how to build one Docker container, but what if I have 30 different hosts in a bunch of different areas? How can I control them living and dying? And so Kubernetes is going to bring together a lot of these concepts. Kubernetes is going to have things like service discovery. Kubernetes has things like, a, like so Kubernetes has NTD. Um, that's, a, that's a console server. That's exactly what those two things do. Um, I believe they have a secrets management thing built into Kubernetes. But these, if you look across all of them, are a lot of the tools that we like to talk about when we talk about automation, right? They're the buzzwords that get thrown out there. And there's a lot of different things you can do with these. Um, I know Packet.net, which is Packet.com, does bare metal cloud, does some really cool things where they build their machines inside Docker containers as part of their testing procedures. Um, that was insanely cool to me. So there's a, there's a lot of things that you can do with this stuff. Okay. I have talked at you for like a half hour. Do you want to take a break? Okay. Cool. Let's actually do something. So we'll, we'll dive into Packer and Baker today. Um, we're going to start with Packer. So the idea of Packer is essentially, again, you can build a box that will run just about anywhere, and you can do it off the same amount of code. This all comes back to how can you write code that will consistently deploy stuff that you don't have to write multiple times. So Packer has three aspects to it. It's got a builder, and another way to think about a builder is just how are you actually instantiating that VM? So it will have a way to integrate with VMware Workstation, it has a way to integrate with VirtualBox, it has a way to integrate with Libvirt if you install a plugin, um, it has a way to integrate with Amazon and Google and all these different places. And all this is really doing on a builder level is getting that box up and running with nothing on it. Right? So it just it, it'll get you through the point of I have the OS installed. And now what do you want to do? The provisioner is where you make a special. So once you have a CentOS box running there, um, do you want to update it? Do you want to run a shell script? Do you want to install HTTP? What do you want to do after CentOS has been installed and is running? And then finally, the post processor is, I've broken the box down. It's all done. What do I do with it now? Should I send it somewhere? Should I put it to a place that everybody can get to? Um, so what we'll do today in the post processor is send it up to the Vagrant Cloud, um, which means that, hey, every time I build something, I can go store it someplace that everybody can get to it. So Packer, this is one of the things I love about, uh, about slides. This did not look like this on, on my computer. It does look like it here. Packer is, uh, is a problem pack.io, um, and we'll walk around later if you guys need to. Installing it is a pretty straightforward process. You have to basically download a binary and drop it in somewhere that your path understands it. So on Windows, you may have to type the full path to get Packer to run. On Linux, you generally just have to drop it into like an update directory anywhere, and that'll work. Um, and then, if you don't have Git installed, you should install Git and go out and get clone my project that I built for this, and you'll be able to follow along. I'm not going to try to slow us all down and have us all follow along the same process. Um, there will be some time where I'll walk around and you guys can say, hey, I'm having problems with this or problems with that. All right. And then a Packer build is pretty straightforward. It just takes a JSON file in it. So you just say Packer build and then the JSON file. And the JSON files where all the magic happens. All right. 
If you are like, hey, Packer is a fairly confusing thing, there are people out there that have solved this problem in, in some grand detail. They really have. Um, there's a box cutter is probably my favorite. They have Windows builds. They have Linux builds. I believe they have BSD builds. I think they have Mac builds, although Mac is kind of funky because you have to be on a Mac if you're on a Mac virtual machine unless you are willing to do things that may or may not be legal. So I, Mac has some funky terms of, uh, of use that I just don't like to deal with very often. Okay, so the builders are going to be written in JSON. We'll take a look at one here in a second. And the thing you have to remember about a virtual machine is a virtual machine is really just a file that is a virtual hard disk <coughs> and some sort of metadata that describes how much CPU and how much memory it should get. Um, should it have a display? Just, but it, they're generally pretty simple. So if you're familiar with VMware, this is a VMX file, right? It's just a key value. Hey, this is how many CPUs I want, this is how much memory I want, um, do I want to have that virtualization, <coughs> things like that. In Libvirt, it's called a domain. And it's an XML file. That's all this is really doing is saying, how do you, how do you want to set this up so you get the resources that you want? Um, the builders can run in parallel. So I will show you that VMware and VirtualBox can run at the same time. Uh, VirtualBox, VMware, and Kimu can't all run at the same time because VirtualBox and Kimu will both try to access the kernel the same way and will run into each other. So if I wanted to do this, I might tell that to build it off, off on a different machine. And it will take either the actual CentOS ISO, um, in the case that we're doing, or it will take a pre-built hard drive. And so the pre-built hard drive should help you a lot if you don't, if you just want an updated CentOS image, you might build your first stage from ISO, and then the second stage you would have it take that ISO or take the hard drive you just built in and actually start provisioning it. So you can break stuff out so you don't have to continuously update every single time you want to build a slightly different machine. There's also an HTTP server that will run locally on it. So if you can do things over HTTP with whatever you're trying to build, that will, uh, that will work. You don't have to go out and host a separate web server to do that. Um, that's really, really useful for things like Kickstarts. So I think Dev Bootstrap, is it Dev Bootstrap? Bootstrap? Yeah, the, the, yeah, bootstrap is what I call it. Yeah, D Bootstrap. Um, there's, there's a, is, is that the one that actually has like the automated install? Yeah, all you have to do is just use Bootstrap and just keep a stable URL. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think that I think that's what. It, but if you want to see how they actually use it, they do have a uh, a box cutter for this that you could actually dig into. Um, and then finally, one of the things it can do is, especially in Windows, this is useful, where you kind of have to click through some stuff in the Windows setup process unless you have an unattend. Um, the same thing for uh, for Linux kind of do have to tell it I have a Kickstarter, and so you actually can tell it to open up and arrow right twice and, and do some other stuff if you need to simulate that user input to get, what you're, get done what you're actually trying to do. Uh, provisioner, same thing, it's a script. Um, it will take a lot of stuff. It will do Ansible, it will do Puppet, it will do Chef, it will do PowerShell, Shell, um, and you can also mix and match those. So you'll see in mine, I have some Shell, and then some Ansible, and then some Shell. And then finally, where, where do you actually want this to arrive? Um, I can see that I can spell cloud well. Um, but you can do a bunch of stuff. You can send it off to Vagrant Cloud. You can put it up to Amazon as an AMI. You can compress it or send it off to a local web server. You can shoot it up to vSphere. It'll do a bunch of stuff. I will tell you the Vagrant Cloud piece of it, for whatever reason, Packer, I do not have great luck with it. So I have moved on. You may have fantastic luck with it. Like there's a, there's a great deal of this that's what was everybody running on their machines and um, what specifically is breaking. So that is Packer. So let's actually take a look. Okay. So this is a uh, So this is, if you do get clone my stuff, you will see that I, I have this built right now. And if you look inside the Packer directory, that's where everything will build. Um, before I do go in the Packer directory, I will show you um, 
One of the things you're going to want to do as you start doing this, especially if you like to use Git, I'm a huge fan of using Git because it lets me track what the hell I just wrote. You will want to block some stuff out because it will build a ton of binaries. And those binaries are very big. Git doesn't like binaries, um, nor would you really want to, to be downloading all the binaries that are temporary times in, a, in, in the process. So what it's actually blocking out here is this is where it's going to store the VMware um, ISO. That's where it's going to store the, the virtual box um, build. And I just don't ever want those to end up in Git complaining that, hey, this file changed. And that just makes my life, easier. But makes my life a lot easier. So if we go into Packer. There we go. That actually worked. I think I just got lucky there. All right. So sweet. So I have this access token. Um, I'm going to change this access token after, but if you guys would be polite and not use my access token up to upload stuff to Bigger Cloud, I'd really appreciate it. I think I have enough time before before that makes it to the internet. <laughs> All the same, this is why some stuff you'll see me kind of yank stuff over and be like, do I really have any secrets in here before I put them up here? This is where Secrets Manager becomes really helpful, right? The API keys are designed to actually deal with this environment. Um, I didn't get to this point during this, but with what Cloud I really want to do was just drop you guys all API keys to use my Google Cloud, because then I can reject them at the end and say, no, no, you guys are done. You no longer have access. And I wouldn't even have great user accounts for you guys to do that, so that would have been really cool. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get there. So, so really quickly, um, let's walk through a couple things I'm doing here. So Packer Build. This file, um, and I'm going to kick the build off and then we'll do the file. This file will build a bunch of different things. I only want it to build the VMware version right now. Um, and then I'm passing and overriding some variables right on the line. So um, every single time I build this, as I update the versions, um, depending on how I want to do it for me, I've just been doing it live in the command line. Command line overrides everything. But if I was working in a team, I'd probably want to make sure it made it into the, uh, it made it into the actual file. Or, if I was really clever and I had everything set up, this is a place the console would shine. Because this is where you could go back to that centralized key value store. Instead of changing a really little thing in a text file that probably doesn't need to be changed, I could actually feed that version from console. And if that version became relevant for other things, other things could query that database and say, hey, what version of this box did you just build? So there's a lot of value to using that centralized key value store. That's a really good example of a, hey, I just want this variable. I just want some, what, what version, what package version am I on right, on right now? Um, same thing for box uh, tag. So in this case, I want it to be a, the Dino Home Lab um, because I'm, that's the box I'm building. But if I was going to build a variety of boxes, I might want to be able to publish a bunch of different boxes. So one of the boxes that I will eventually start building here is just going to be a CentOS machine that's been fully updated. That's it, nothing installed on it. This box will have Docker installed on it. It'll have Libvirt installed on it. It will have um, Zero Tier installed on it. We haven't talked about Zero Tier yet, but I'll show that to you in a second. And then finally, the access token is just, how do I get to the Vagrant Cloud? Um, you can, in fact, store this stuff as environment variables. I was fighting with environment variables last night. I think I actually finally got them to work, but in the meantime, I just needed to move on and do what I was actually there to do not figure out why an environment very low is coming in. And then uh, finally, I can summarize all of that in a bar file. So I could take all of these uh, variables and just sum them to a, a different file. Um, and the centos.json is the file that will actually run. So demo gods are kind enough to continue running. Sweet, yes? Five minutes. Five minutes to? Till the end of the talk. You're at 9.40, right? Or 9.50, right? This is like three hours. Yeah, no, this, this is a workshop. Never mind, my bad. <laughs> sorry. Hi, sorry. You, you made me, I was like, Yeah, I just this looked is it the up. First time I've like, to see anything, you're telling me to get out of here. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. like, sorry, my bad. No, no, no that's, that's, that's perfectly okay. This totally must have screwed the day. Alright, so this is this is one of those things that happen sometimes. There's there's two, like I like said, demo gods are, are what they are. There's two ways you can solve this. Um, one way I could I could actually delete that directory, or if I add a dash f, I think I can add that side. Yeah, no, I can add that. Um, so I can okay, 
there was a lot of easier ways to do that, but... Oh, is it dash force? Sorry. It's one of those things, right? Everybody has a slightly different way, even in... So this should ignore the fact that I have a disk created and just overwrite it. That's what force does. Um, so what it's doing right now is downloading or copying ISO. So basically you can say, here's the ISO. Here's the place that exists on your drive. If you find it on the drive, use that one. Don't go download it. But let's say you don't have it on the drive. Go out and download it from wherever I happen to be downloading it from Pittsburgh, I believe. So let's go actually see what this is doing. Um, it's going to start doing its stuff. This is the HTTP server that's going to serve up a... Uh, Different information, and let's take a peek at let's take a peek at what this uh, file actually looks like. So, here is the first thing that I hate about Packer. I think familiarity breeds contempt. So, I think all this stuff is cool when I hear what it can do, and then I start <laughs> using it, and I slowly learn to hate it for different reasons. Um, one of the things I hate is they use JSON. The problem with JSON is JSON doesn't do comments really well. So they actually have this special field here with this underscore comment that you can use to add comments to whatever you're doing. But that's one of the things I actually really like about like Ansible and YAML is I can add a hashtag. I think everybody understands pretty universally that hashtags are comments. And I believe in commenting code. Uh, this is a little bit harder to do. Every single one of these builders gets defined differently. So builders, and then it starts with a square bracket, which in JSON means a list. So that means that everything inside here, inside of that curly brace, is a description of one thing. And then you'll have a comma at the end, and it'll list several different builders. Um, and so we will, we will go through all the different, uh, different builders and talk about some, what some of the different things mean that I think are important. Uh, but what's important for right now is that you just see, hey, this divides. So that's what the uh, Lippert one does. This is what the, um, where is the type? going to describe it, which one this is. Ah, VMware. So you can set them all right there it's in the type, and then just add just about anything that you want. So if you have custom VMX commands that you want to put in there, um, little, uh, little key value things, you can totally do that even if it doesn't natively support it. Same thing, this one's a virtual box, and I pulled out, I believe, the parallels. Or did I? I don't know, I pulled out the parallels. I did not pull out the parallels one. All right, so if you do have Mac, and you do use parallels, that totally exists. Um, we will talk about, we will talk about uh, the different things you can do with some of these builders in a little while. Okay, so this is one of those areas that's kind of weird. Remember how I showed you it was builders, and then provisioners, and then post-processors? This is just JSON, so you can actually order those any way you want. And for whatever reason, the box cutter people who I stole this from, thank you very much, um, actually do that. So they run the post processors, and at the bottom they run provisioners. Um, I'm, I'm sure they have a, a method to their madness, but that does sometimes confuse me because I always like look at the bottom of the file for the post processors, and I don't find it. Um, post processors, you can see that I am saying, hey, go create a vagrant box, and then go upload that vagrant box to the cloud. Every single time I do this, that's what should happen. And then, down here, is where you can actually see the provisioners. If you want to run a shell script, see all this junk over here? That is documented for you. So you don't have to be like, oh my god, I have no idea how to pipe that properly. What it's essentially doing is piping all of the scripts that are listed here into the system and using a, a pseudo password for it. So they're, they're, it's echoing the pseudo password and passing it and running it. So know that if you want to run a shell script, don't get too bent out of shape that you don't know how to pipe like that. They, they have an example that they explain pretty well in the documentation. And then, once I run that shell script and update the machine, I'm going to run all of my playbooks. And once I run all of my playbooks, I'm going to run another shell script, set of shell scripts, that are specifically going to clean the box off. And so some of these things are going to do things like write zeros to the end of the drive to make it as small as possible. There's a whole bunch of stuff that this will, will do. And again, I didn't have all this stuff. I didn't design all this stuff. This is stuff that I, I stole from the fine folks over at Box Cutter. Right? And they do similar things with Windows. So you can get to a state where Windows pretty much works 
and then start tweaking and customizing and trying to get it to do what you really, really want it to do. All right. And then you have all the variables you can set. So a brief note on variables. Um, you can set them like this down here. You can also have them pull from the environment variables on that local machine. So that's a really, really good way to handle things like secrets that you don't want to do what I did, put them in the command line. <coughs> um, they do have, down here, they are supposed to pull from the environment page. Like I said, I was fighting with them. I believe that I had a problem with capitalization and I misread the documentation. So what I thought the documentation said was that if it's lowercase here, that it needs to be capitalized in the environment variable. I do not think I was right about that. Um, but it is all JSON. The only tricky thing about uh, the environment variable is theoretically you should be able to use them at any point in the system, but for whatever, they, they said it was simpler. The, the folks at Packer actually went ahead and said, if you're going to use an environment variable, you have to set it equal to another variable, and then you have to call it up, up at the top. So really briefly, where it says user, that's just another way of saying it's a variable that you define. There are variables that are not user variables, and so we'll take a look at those when we actually dive into these builders up here. And so some of the user, some of the variables that are are not user, let me see if I can find here, there we go. So see this leading dot here? That's another way of saying inside that builder, whatever, whatever the HTTP server that you started up and the HTTP port that started up, it will take off the system. So you don't need to figure that out. If it's going to start a web server for you, that's how you can get to it. So you can use that anywhere you might have to make a web server call. So you can see this as it's going along, as I've been talking, it's just cranking along. And so it's a, it goes through. <coughs> and so it's going to start. I gave it a four, so it said, hey, I'm going to clean up all that junk. And now I'm going to create your, uh, your disk. I'm going to create that VMX file. I know how to do that. I'm going to create your uh, HTTP server, and then I'm going to start the machine up. All right? And you can, if you want to, connect over VNC to reach into the machine while it's building. Um, you can also, if you want to, actually run VMware Workstation. There we go. And you can scan for virtual machines. There we go. And there's that CentOS machine that we're building right now. And if I were to reach into this, I would see it doing a bunch of stuff. I don't want to reach into it. I'd like to be all automated. But if you do have something failing in the middle and you're like, you know what, I need to get into the guts of this machine and see what's happening at the time that it's failing, this is a technique that you can use to get in there. You can also connect over VNC. It offers a lot of options. Um, you can connect, I believe, over Spice as well, too. Like, I, I, there's, there's no shortage of options. But it does the very first thing, right? It comes through and says, hey, I'm going to update all this stuff. So it reaches out over the internet and says, I, uh, I'm going to update. And then it's going to reboot. And now it's going to reach in. It's going to start provisioning with my Ansible. And it's going to reach through all those Ansible things. And when it's all done with that, it will go ahead and say, I'm going to pack you up and ship you off. And the cool part about this is that I'm not going to do it right now on this machine because it's the demo. Um, but you could actually run VirtualBox and VMware at the same time. They would run both hypervisors. There would be no conflict. You can run VMware and Kimu um, at the same time. There would be no conflict. The part where you're really going to bang your head against the wall is to um, try to get all three of those running because then they're just going to have conflicts. But that's where the cloud can be really helpful. If you know how to pre-install the stuff in the cloud, you can just say, hey, go spin a server up, go build it up. <coughs> and get rid of it. So something like Nomad would be really useful there. You can tell Nomad, hey, every night at 3 a.m., I want you to go build all, all my servers for me, upload them to a place I can access the next day, and then kill that job. It's a thing you can do. It is doing right now some things um, that it's skipping. And so this is going to become relevant because we're going to go build a bare metal, um, bare metal server on packet.com. And what's cool about that is I wanted to use this exact same playbook, so I just tell it, hey, in this, I don't want you to pull CentOS and install this, because I think that's a lot of weight for a VM that I'm going to shove around the internet. But on the packet.net 
bare metal server, as I'm playing along, a lot of times that's actually exactly what I want is to just have a bare metal ISO that I can get to right then and there, and I don't want to have to download it every time. So this is a way that I can say, hey, use the same stuff, but if I pass you certain arguments, do different things. Other than that, I want the exact same build procedure. I don't want anything to be different on this machine if I'm trying to test Keen locally than I do in the cloud when I actually try to run production. All right, so we will this guy go away for a while again. That is better off just actually using the notes. Okay, so builder. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, they have this thing called an accelerator. If you guys have never used Libvirt before, hype. Virtualization on Linux is a little bit weird because with with things like Hyper-V and VMware, they just kind of are. You get ESXi, it's a hypervisor, it has everything there. If you want to automate all those things, you pretty much have to get vSphere. There's not a bunch of different packages. In, in Linux land, if you're trying to use KVM, there's a ton of little pieces you kind of plug together to get this fully functioning hypervisor the way you want it to be. So Kimu is essentially an emulator. And by itself, it's just a type 2 hypervisor. It will just run some stuff, and it won't do anything to, to make that faster. It will not have any type 1 properties. If you run KVM, the kernel virtual machine, it will actually hook down to the kernel, and now it's a type 1 hypervisor, and it will run natively. That's, that's what Kimu and KVM essentially have to each other. <coughs> Libvirt is actually the, the piece that will talk to all of those different things and help you orchestrate stuff across a bunch of them. And Libvirt cannot just talk to, to KVM and Kimu. Libvirt will actually talk to vSphere and a bunch of other hypervisors. So Libvirt is, is a very multi-purpose thing. And then there's some control platforms like Versh and Virtual Machine Manager that you can actually use to give some user interface to those platforms. So that's all. When it says accelerator, it just means that there's KVM's not the only one out there. KVM's just one of the more popular ones. Headless. So headless just means that you can either run this and have a screen actually pop up like I just did um, to actually pull that stuff in. So I had to do that because on the VMware one, headless is set to the variable for headless, which is... Uh, I actually do not want to have that pulling normally. I just kind of want it to run in the background, tell me when it's done. But otherwise, I just have console screens popping up on my uh, my window. So you can change it right there. The Kimu args, this is just where I set memory and uh, CPUs. Uh, disk interface. So these two things will bite you if you try to do Kimu with Windows. Because Windows, out of the box, I found out, um, in its very early stages, does not have drivers to install with those. Windows will support Bird I.O., Windows will support QCOW2, but you would have to do driver injection. They don't do it natively. So once I fixed those two things, um, I, I had what amounted to a 10-second fix for a problem that I had to work on for uh, probably eight hours because I'm just not that smart. Like, I got a lot, I, I got a lot of Googling to do. Um, you got to obviously set disk size. Same thing with that device. Um, you got to be careful. This is Bird I.O. net. You will need, I think it's RTL, whatever the RTL one is, in Kimu when you're doing the initial build for Windows, or you're going to need to do some injection. This is, remember how I told you you could do it off the hard drive and then foul over to the URL? That's where you do that. So that's a list. You can make that as long as you want, and it'll just keep trying until it finds one that matches. And then the way you know you got the thing you wanted is it has a checksum. Um, you can also do the <coughs> checksum types. You can do MD5, you can do SHOT1, SHOT256, whatever you want to do. And... And again, so headless, I had to find here twice. Once up top, once down at the bottom. And what I learned by screwing that up was that the last one wins. So it's, it's not whichever one's hard set, it's just whatever one comes last. Then the VM name while you build it, and the output directory. They're, they have a thing, and I'll show you in the post processor, that will delete that output directory if all you want is the artifact you create. In my case, I do actually want to hold on to this because sometimes I want to build a hard drive for later stages, and sometimes I don't. Uh, the HTTP directory is, so whatever you want to serve up over that web server it starts, is going to get stored in that directory. And then it's going to pick a random port 
and you can set the ranges of those ports. And because your firewall will also start yelling at you if you have a good firewall set up and say, I don't want contact that I don't explicitly define. It does have a, an SSH password and an SSH username that you can, again, set that it will, it will use to access. Especially this is important if it's a hard drive you've already configured. Um, otherwise, it will just build to whatever you put in your, uh, your pre-populated scripts. And then finally, the boot command. This is where you can uh, actually type stuff in. So when you watch this thing boot the first time around, it will actually go in and how you would normally get into the kernel and change the, the parameters to get it to launch to a kickstart. This is where I can tell it to do that. And wait literally means type the up arrow, wait. I define wait to be 10 seconds. That's a default. Then it will hit tab. It will wait 10 seconds. Then it will type that text, and then it will launch. And then the shutdown command is again, how do you want to how do you want to stop this thing? And as you go through, you're going to see these all get really similar, right? So this is VMware's, a lot of the same commands. Um, the only place you really get different is things like VMX data. Up there, we had I think. Uh, Key Mwarks, it's VMX data. So there's there's a lot of similarities be, um, along all of this. One of the other things I don't like about JSON, if there's that many similarities, I would I would like there to be a place that I can just say here's common to every machine, and then break out what's different. Um, I don't know of a good way to do that in JSON. If you guys are smarter than me, by by all means, um, there's a few different ways I've thought with like templating that would might help that a lot, but. That's, a, that's an actually an area that Jinja 2 would help in Ansible, where you just make a, a template and then have it roll what you want it to roll. Same things. Post processors. So the keep input artifact, do you want to keep that hard drive? Box cutter won't. Box cutter will just create you the box. Um, it's important to know that for Vagar, all a box is is really just a hard drive <coughs> and a description of how to start it. Like that's, that's all that's in there. It's just a tar archive. So if you wanted to not do all of this, if you wanted to go to Balm Hub, for example, and pull down those hard drives, um, all you would have to do, there's a, there's a format. You can create your own. You just tar up the box of the Vagrant file, and you're, you're in pretty good shape, and I can show you that too. So go out, create a Vagrant box for me. Um, I can, again, that Vagrant file is what defines how it's going to run. And then finally, I want you to upload, and this is where Look at that box save, look at that version, and use my access token. And these are, again, are all the, uh, the variables. And these are the process. Now, the expect disconnect is uh, true. That's if you want to reboot. It just says, hang out for a second, this thing will come back, but you are going to have a problem with connectivity for a little while. Ansible. This was one thing that haunted me, too. The problem that we tend to have, in, 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 at least I have, is I have about 900 keys in my SSH agent, and almost every server I've ever gone to will try like three or four, and then exhaust its authentication attempts. What Identities only does is says ignore the SSH agent, SSH with the key that I told you to SSH with. And because this is going to create a temporary key, that's really important. It will not connect otherwise. And so I had to do that with Ansible. And you can do that with SSH extra args in an Ansible playbook. So I have installed Docker, and I have installed Libvirt, and I have installed Zero Tier. And then finally, you go through the, uh, the variables down here. And again, it's saying take all those variables, pipe them, include them as your environment variables, and then run all of these. Could these all be Ansible? Yes. The reason that Boxcutter didn't go the Ansible route was because with a shell command, all I need is bash. I can run everything right on the box. I don't need you to have anything extra which means this is very portable from Windows to Linux to anything I want to run on. All I need to do is be able to build the box and get into the box. The problem when I did Ansible the way I did Ansible is I'm running Ansible on my local machine. So if I'm a Windows machine and Windows doesn't like Ansible, that means that I'm going to have a problem. This is not nearly as portable anymore. The same thing is going to happen for uh, if I do the Ansible local. Now I have to install Ansible on the machine that I am building, which I also may not want to do. So those are why you might want to choose different features. <coughs> if you're a puppet or you're a chef guy, it definitely supports them. You can either support them as the centralized server, like this is part of my infrastructure. Every time I build this, take from my infrastructure, go out, install the agent, make it all work the way you want to. 
or you can use, I know there's Chef Solo, I forget what Puppet's version of Chef Solo is, but it's basically an agent that takes that configuration directly and doesn't do anything different. Um, and again, that pause before, that's just a, hey, sometimes if you move too fast with the computer, if you actually move at machine speed, things get really wonky, so if you give it a little time to, to rest, it will make a difference. Uh, this is actually where I can find a lot of the stuff that uh, you saw up the top. So the headless, I don't have to find. Usually I have to find that right on the command line. Um, install Vagrant key. So that is, a, that is an opportunity. There's a default. When Vagrant runs, you install a default SSH key that the private and public key are available on the internet. They are part of the Git repo. Vagrant is different because when Vagrant starts up, it uses that default private and public key to get into the box and immediately changes it. You know how there's default passwords and we tell everybody, go change that shit? Nobody ever changes it. Vagrant doesn't leave that to the, the user. The very first thing Vagrant does once it gets into that brand new box you spun up is change the, the uh, key. But in order to get in, it does need a default. You can also see this is where I decide to point off to go get my stuff. Um, yeah, these are, these are any variable that you might need. And so these are two that I had added towards the end. So let's see where we're at on. So, so this is one of those fun things, right? This is, a, this is a demo, and of course there's going to be a problem. So the problem that's actually happening in this is at the zero tier install. And I have definitely had this problem before. Zero tier. Zero tier is using the manufacturer recommended Perl script. Um, I sometimes have problems with this GPG verification piece. So one of the things that I, I do want to go back through is what this is actually doing is going out and installing a repo on the machine. Um, I do want to go back through and rewrite my playbook to just go grab the actual repo file and install the package without having to do verification like this. Um, I, can, I can inject trust without having to use GPG. It does not always work perfectly in the, the system. All right. This takes a while, right? Like building each one of these takes a little while. So that's where it's helpful to really stage it out and say, hey, let's build an updated machine, then let's go install zero here. So if, if it fails like this, I don't have to go all the way back to the beginning and reinstall everything. If, if we look, though, because I've been building this for a little while, There is hard drives for my, my various versions. All right, that's just a cute how to image. And if you look through here, I have one for VirtualBox and I have one for VMware. I'm not sure where it's hiding out here right now. Maybe I don't have one. Maybe I did leave one for VMware. But but those are those are those input artifacts that it was talking about. What I'm actually outputting is over in here. And, and so underneath uh, each one of these is a fully functioning Vagrant box. And what this is designed to do, and again, the reason you want to stage some of the stuff if you can <coughs> is Vagrant likes to, clean, likes to clean up after itself. So you can set it that if any of this stuff fails, it just go back through and delete everything so you start fresh. Um, it can be really frustrating to spend 15 minutes especially if you don't have a great internet connection. Building a box, getting all the way to the end, having it fail on something stupid that you could have pretty easily fixed, like uploading a machine, that you got to it, you actually got to that next stage. Um, that's, that's where that becomes really handy. So if you don't include all that stuff together and you try to stage stuff out, it will make your life a little more pleasant. It's going to create all of those boxes, and then you can actually use them in Vagrant. So, anybody want to break? We, we can take a, take a little five minute break. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay. So the other two things that I'm going to do are go to Vagrant. We'll walk through Vagrant. And then I'm going to go and build a box and pack it. And I will install some stuff out there. We'll spin some stuff up. And then finally I'll show you zero here. Is there anybody that, has, that wants to go to another talk that would like to see any of those things faster? I know we haven't talked about zero chair at all. I can bring zero chair and do zero chair now you guys prefer.
I was interested because of my own stuff. I do not have these all the charges. So these will all work on the local machine. Yes. Yeah, so the whole point of this is stop that works locally. Uh, I think that you can send it like well, I think I told you that you told me you're mine. You should have one. I've never talked to you about that. All this stuff downloaded. Yeah. <laughs> when you say you're running on the ball, so the, they use a conversation that I really want to have, right? Like, I know what I'm going to do, but when we gave away my phone, so what, what would you want to do? Well, I probably would make the word three servers in the room. Barely. Okay. Um, one of them is the virtual. Okay. I mean, four running virtual parts. Okay. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, so we'll, we'll do this, we'll end up doing this next, anyways. So, can you build the script? Can you get it down with it? Which one? The one that you're running right now. Um, the one I'm running right now, I started with what box code gives me, the web app and then I started tuning it. Like, it didn't have chemo in there by default. And the chemo is definitely something that I wanted. Uh, I just I get yeah, and, and that's not good for everybody. It's, it, it just was what I was trying to do because it, it's what runs on production and like we did. Have the 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 so, so like, and these are things. It's got a really rich ecosystem around it. It's well supported. There was just a lot of reasons. Um, virtual box is cool. Virtual box is important as a virtualization. Yeah, our workstation is cool. Yeah, our workstation is like how You see, I used to run VM more, but well, it's for yeah. two different things. For a virtual box. There's, there's no little wrong with it. I mean, every once in well, a while you'll run into stuff. It's, there are people that well, run into a virtual box for no other reason. No other reason. That's probably a break. Oh, it's a three hour. Yeah, we should have a um, are you good? I'm just trying, I'm walking uh, around checking yeah, on everybody. No, I wanted to take a break and just walk for a second because I wanted to get or figure out where to go a little bit of Red Bull. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Where I was going to get it was coffee. Yeah, well, hey, you know. Yeah. Um, I thought your son's really polite. So it's going to call out right now. Oh, yeah. The website's a pretty good internet. It's like the best business card I've ever seen. It is. Is that your business? No, 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 I wish. How long is it? Check this out. Is that the best business I've ever seen? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll find him and get him a card. Or get him to give you a card. I like that. I want to find out where he got those. Yeah, it's coming over the internet. He might have just made the design himself, like. Yeah, or just gone. Then made a custom design. This is being expensive, though. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a wannabe hologram depression. So if you already have virtual boxes. Yeah. I tried to make this in high school. Yeah. yeah. I'm running Windows 10. I just wanted to show it to other people in our group that didn't see it. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to find Adrian to find I out if he wants to. He's in this track. He's in track. He's in track. He's in track. He's in track. Okay, I'm trying to find out. Do so you want me to stop this and split this into like three yeah. videos? Yeah, you're like part one, part two. Yeah, is that what he said? I, that's what I talked to my dad about. That's, that's what he said I should do for my This, this can be virtual box only. I have to show you guys. Well. So three hours. This is one yeah, of so fast. So, so, so they just cut the recording, copy the first one, then add a little thing at the end. So it's part one, and part two, and so on. Just on the other yeah, just give me a part one and part two, man. I'm gonna say and I'll just put them together in post. It's not post up, Adrian. Oh, I was just gonna have them just change part one. You would title and make it part two, part three. Why that's bother? This is the file. Put one in right. one, put two in the other, and I'll put it back them together. Yeah. And just roll. So, so the cool things about KVM and Kimu is they tend to underpin a lot of the major clouds out there. DigitalOcean uses it, um, Google Cloud uses it. Notably, AWS did not. AWS used Zen. <coughs> AWS is slowly <laughs> migrating to KVM. They have some new platforms that are only running on KVM. Um, I do not know if they plan to get off of Zen entirely. I looked around. I, I remember there was a big news article when they first said, hey, we're, we're moving over to KVM, and then they pulled that statement off their web page. Um, and so I don't know specifically how they're planning to treat that now. And then Azure is, is Hyper-V under the hood. But it should be pointed out that in all those major cloud cases, yes, they are that technology, but they're not necessarily the off-the-shelf technology. So Hyper-V, Hyper-V is tuned for Microsoft-specific use case. Zen is tuned for Amazon's use case. Same thing for any of the uh, 
the other cloud providers. They're, they, they need their stuff to work, and they're going to make sure it fits their environment the way it has to. If you insist on using VMware, and I totally get why you would, VMware might be what you support at work, right? <laughs> if you've not heard of the VMUG Advantage membership, you should totally check it out. Because if you look at VMware Workstation, I think when I looked at the last time, you were paying just shy of $200 to get a, a license to Workstation Pro. Um, for about $200, you get a year trial, or not trial, but you get a year licensed um, experience to not just VMware Workstation, but also to ESXi, vSphere, and all the other things. My biggest gripe, honestly, with VMware, VMware, I have never had a just works experience as well as I usually do with VMware. If I just want to do something with VMware, it generally pretty much works. The way VMware gets there is they really limit the platforms they support and like they, they target, they do what they do and they, they focus on that. Keymove, you can bend into a bunch of different shapes. It's not always necessarily going to work. It's not always going to necessarily work well. But it turns out that for most home labs or ranges or whatever, we're not really after the, the cutting edge and performance. We're after something that works well enough for what we're trying to do. Right? So we don't have to, to support these like huge read, read write rates on MySQL databases, for example. Um, VMware? So VMware, for example, yes, it's not you can't install a laptop without installing specialized drivers for the most part. It's, it's generally kind of difficult. Kimu will just do that. It'll let you install their packages, and it's pretty easy to do. So, so that's, that's one, of my, one of my gripes with VMware, is that it, it's the cost, and then finally it's the fact that if you really want to automate VMware, I don't know of a way to just reach straight into ESXi and do the sort of automation I want to do. Um, for the most part, I've seen that you have to have vSphere to really support automation, migration, those sorts of things with ESXi. So... Again, for one year, it's 200 bucks. For two years, it's 360, and for three years, it's 510. Um, so, if you are thinking, "Hey, I want to go invest in a VMware workstation," one of the things to think about is they they do update it, and they do make you pay update fee, upgrade fees. So, depending on how how much you do with VMware, it may be a better deal for you to try the VMware Advantage thing. Um, I've had good luck with it, and I will continue to pay for it because sometimes I do need to support VMware products. And one of the cool things with nested virtualization is I can run ESXi on a Libvirt hypervisor so I can run those test cases. And then with really good automation, I can get a consistent vSphere environment that I can test against. So, one of the things that I really, really like about VMware is... Or, no, I'm sorry, not, not VMware. Uh, Kimu. Is it's it's pretty simple under the hood, and what I mean by that all Kimu does when it starts up is essentially run a command, and this is the command right here. So when you look in your system process, it's running Kimu x86, and then it runs a ton of flags. A domain file is an XML file, and the XML file describes all of these flags. But if I copy and paste that command and rerun it, it will start the machine back up. And so a lot of the stuff that's in there, you don't actually need it to run. It's just stuff that kind of got injected by default. So if you need a really simple way to run a live CD, you can feed it to Kimu system, and it will just run your live CD. So you just want to run Kali, and you want to run it on a Kimu, you can just feed it to that parameter, and it'll run. So you don't need to actually create a whole VM to do it. Or I should say you don't need to create a whole domain file. I mean, technically, that is. <coughs> so, so that was one of the things I really liked. The other thing I really liked about that is if I have good shared storage, um, to me, this feels a little bit easier just to reach out and run Kimu on different systems if that's all I want to do is run it for a little while and I know what I want to run. If it's got the hypervisor installed and access to the hard disk, that's, that's a way to do it. All right. Um, so you can run a custom shared storage. So one of the really popular ones out there right now is Ceph. There's also Gluster. There's a whole bunch of different ways. You can just use straight up NFS. Um, and again, when you're in the cloud, the nice part about shared storage is 
my storage and where I actually run the VM from don't have to be the same spot anymore if I have good shared storage. So if I go out there and say, hey, I want this one machine, this is where I'm going to hold all of my hard disks and I'm going to feed them to this, uh, this machine that's only going to exist for a little while, that's a technique. Um, and then finally, one of the things I really, really like about it is you can run custom networking, I think, a lot easier than you can in a lot of providers. And so zero tier and open vSwitch are two different approaches to this problem. Zero tier, which I'll show you in just a second, is going to be an agent, essentially, that runs on every machine. And it's going to run as a VPN, and it's also going to run as what's called a software-defined network. And what's really cool about that is I can basically <coughs> say how the different VMs talk to each other. So that's zero tier. It can install in any box. And because it can install in any box, that means you can run it on VirtualBox or VMware or, uh, or any of the other platforms, right? That would go like that. Open vSwitch is meant to run at the hypervisor level. You can run Open vSwitch on a machine, but that's not really where it shines. What Open vSwitch will do is if you've ever done Linux networking before, um, VMs generally join a bridge. So if you were to look at you were to look at my networks. Sorry. That went well. Okay, so if you were to look at my networks, you were gonna see a hub. It's and coming back, I'm sure. Let's uh mostly. So go. No, so if you were to if you were to look ah. and and all these machines so you can see these NICs that actually go on the bridges. Um, and bridges essentially work like hubs. So they're all going to have the same collision domain. They're all going to have those same sorts of problems that we used to have with hubs. Open vSwitch, I can get in. And with Open vSwitch, I can actually VLAN off machines. So Open vSwitch is really cool for that. But what the really selling point of Open vSwitch to me is this. Let's say I have my home machine. And then I have my host out in the cloud. If you were sitting on your home machine and you were like, I have these three different VLANs. I have a management VLAN. I have a user VLAN. I have things that are keeping these different people from talking to each other. And I don't want my management VLAN to route at all to my user's VLAN. Right? I just want that to be a single, a single flat network. That is challenging to do if you don't have a flat network all the way out to the cloud, which obviously you don't. So the way this used to get solved, one of the ways, is with something called is with something called GRE tunnels. And GRE tunnels would essentially take every single one of those VLANs and wrap it up with another set of encapsulation and route it over to here and then drop it back down into that VLAN. So you could extend with a GRE tunnel over there. VXLAN is, is the way that it's more popularly done now. It's certainly the way you're going to see it done in OpenStack. And this will let you essentially punch VLANs across a routed network. Now, they are encapsulated, not encrypted. Which means that if you don't put encryption on that bad boy, it's going to shoot across the net internet with plain text data. So, if you route across a VPN like WireGuard, you can get your encryption. And WireGuard is native in-kernel um, VPNs, and it's really performant. I've found it to generally be about two times as fast as, um, as OpenVPN. The downside is it plugs into the Linux kernel, so it does not work on Windows, with certain exceptions. So this is how you can do this. Here's the problem. Historically, it's been a bad idea to try to extend Layer 2 networks because Layer 2 networks tend to be chatty, they tend to do broadcasts, they tend to do a ton of ARP requests, and that will just completely saturate this link. And especially if this link's not very fast, that can be a problem. So one of the solutions to this problem is to go ahead and, and look at things like software-defined networks and look at things like proxy ARP. So proxy ARP's pretty cool. Proxy ARP will basically say, hey, Instead of just flooding this request over there, tell me who you're looking for. I'll tell you how to get over there. So that'll cut down some of the chatter. You can also reduce some of the broadcast domains. 
But probably the easiest way to not do that is to just not have a layer two network go from home out to the cloud. And so a technique you could use for that is to say, hey, I want a, I want a management cloud, and then, or I want a management VLAN, and then I want that user VLAN. And then you could divide that user VLAN into two different subnets. So you can kind of have the best of both worlds. You could have this consistent environment that talks back and forth. Um, but you have one subnet on one side and one subnet on the other. And then you're using a routed network over a routed network. And that gets a little bit easier. So that is definitely a solution. Um, see if I can get back here. Sweet. So that's, uh, that's Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch is extremely, extremely powerful. Open vSwitch plugs into things like Open Daylight, where you actually get into software-defined networking. And so I won't talk about software-defined networking a whole lot for Open vSwitch, because I'll show you some examples within uh, in Zero Tier, and you'll see some of the advantages. The basic gist of software-defined networking is, instead of going down to the device, so when you used to have hubs, hubs work like this. I have four ports. I come in this port, I go out all, those, all three of those ports. And if I had two hubs, you'd quickly get a broadcast storm. So I'm, I'm sure some of the people in this room have a great deal of experience with that, where I come in the one port and go out the port, so you just have this um, the circle that happens right here. A switch is smart enough to say, I will flood all of those ports if I don't know where that device is located, but if I do, I will just send it through to where that device is located. And you can also do spanning tree, where spanning tree will say, hey, if I have two links that both go to the same place, I'm going to make sure only one of them is active at any given time. The problem with spanning tree is spanning tree was probably the best solution to that problem at the time of how you keep those loops, but it also means that because you only have one link, you get some really weird paths that data has to travel to come down, even if there is a direct link between two switches, depending on how it's architected. Where software-defined networks start to come into play is to say, how about we don't let each device decide how it's going to pass stuff along? How about if that packet doesn't know what to do, I kick it up to somebody that will tell me what to do with it. And that way you can keep all of those paths open because the only way that packet can go is the way that centralized controller tells it it should go. So it will never pack. It, you essentially won't get a broadcast storm. Um, there's a lot more granular pieces of that. But one of the really cool things about that central controller defining how every packet is going to flow is the fact that you can go and do things at layer two that traditionally we've always had to do at layer three. For example, I can tell two hosts on the same subnet that they're not allowed to talk to each other except over port 22. And I don't have to have a firewall involved to do that. I could do even cooler things. So if you are not familiar with network security monitoring, what it does essentially is a couple of different things. Um, one of the big pieces it does is copy every packet that comes across the network to see where it's going and interpret for itself so you don't have to rely on what the host said it was because if the host is compromised, the host can lie to you. So you can pick stuff up on the wire and take a look at it. The problem with that is how do you actually get a copy of that packet? Um, so you'd have to do things like network taps, for example, where I'd have to go and put something in the system where this wire has a piece right here and everything that crosses that tap that I just put in gets spit out to somewhere else. I could also, if you guys are familiar with uh, switches, use things like span ports. And I could say, hey, everything that comes across these ports, I want you to duplicate a copy and spit it out over here so that can go off where it's supposed to go. The problem with taps is you need a physical place to plug them in. <coughs> and depending on how redundant those connections are, um, you may need multiple places to plug them in. You have to pick really specific places in the network. And you also may incur downtime plugging them in, right? Like, so there's, there's a time you have to plug stuff in and network traffic may have to stop. The problem with spans is they double the workload for a switch, right? So they're a really cool idea until you realize that you just doubled the number of packets that switch is seeing. So a lot of different ways you can look at this problem. Um, but it is a problem and it is a challenge. Here's the real problem. What happens when you start putting all of your stuff out in the cloud? What happens when all of your stuff rides on Amazon? How do you tap the cloud? Solving that problem is pretty difficult. Software-defined networks are a solution to this problem because what a software-defined network can do 
is say everything that crosses in mind, because I'm already telling you what to do, I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to tell you to duplicate that packet and send it where I tell you to send it. <coughs> and we'll see that in zero tier. Zero tier also has a redirect action where if you are, so if you're running an IDS and you just want the duplicate packet off, I just want to know what happened, but I don't want to be in the path, zero tier can actually force itself into the path and say, every time you send a packet, redirect it to my IPS, and then my IPS will drop it back out into the network. So if it is malicious, I can drop it there. And I, the best part about that is I can do it a little bit differently for every packet. I can say, this is trusted communication, I just want a copy of it. This is possibly more dangerous communication, I want an, I, I want an IPS involved in that communication. So it just all depends on how you're trying to solve a problem. <laughs> Linux does something called network namespacing. So we already kind of talked about this one problem where if I have all these VLANs here and all these VLANs here, how do I get them to talk to each other? What happens if I have what's called multi-tenancy? What happens if I have two people on this? I would ordinarily have to say, you can have these VLANs, and you can have these VLANs. There is a third thing that you might want to do. What if you just want them to all have VLANs everywhere, right? So if you're sitting over here, and I say, I want you to have all the VLANs you want, and I don't want your VLAN one to be his VLAN one. Historically, you would have had to have some different networking, probably. So at minimum, you would have needed each host to be different and put a VXLAN and, and do some other stuff. Linux network um, namespacing actually lets you divide that up so the two networks will never, ever see each other. And so you can divide stuff up and drop it into a world. And I'll show you the WireGuard website because WireGuard has a really cool approach to this. What WireGuard will do is say, hey, you can drop this process into this space and then the only way you can get out is over a wire guard interface. So that was that was kind of cool. Um, if you guys are interested in this stuff, like networking at Linux is extremely interesting to me. If you guys are interested, I strongly suggest you look at Scott Lowe's blog, L-O-W-E. He has got some fantastic work that he has done to, to make this stuff work. And it's, it's just really, really cool. Um, lots and lots of things that you can do. And the cool part about all of this is it's all automatable. This L-O-W-E. So what's super cool about all the stuff that I just mentioned is chances are, without all the overhead and weight of a platform like OpenStack, you can still get what you're really trying to do done. That's the thing that I really want to hammer home. There's probably a way that's a lot lighter weight I know what OpenStack is after. It is after data center wide. I'm plugging in racks and racks of servers. I need to manage all of this. I need to have a bunch of people touching it. I need to know who touched what and when. But if you're only managing a host or three hosts, that is overkill. That is just extreme overkill. And if what you are after is trying to learn OpenStack, then yes, you should install OpenStack. But if what you are after is running virtual machines, and you have a specific different use case, there's probably a way to get there that is not going to be nearly as much of a headache. So let's go back. I think this actually might be this is my last page. That's my last page. Sweet. So everything from here on out is demos, questions, and lunch. Okay. So, ah! Go back to here. Oh man, you are still downloading. That's craziness. Let's uh, let's go look at some other stuff while it's downloading. Was that five meg per second you were at? Yeah. It's a. So well, actually, let's let's look at some stuff we've talked about because this is actually a good time. So if you were to go out to the Old vagrant cloud. Try real hard not to expose anything I shouldn't expose here. Okay. So here are the boxes of the building. So one of the cool things is if you go through here, you can look at all of these. Now you can see here are the file sizes. Then I went ahead and Holden Fenner had a good idea, and I should not have good. Okay. When I was when I was seven, um, I. I put a, a Capri Sun in the freezer, and then I came home, 
because I had forgotten it before school, and I really wanted the Capri Sun. So I decided to frost it in the microwave. Not all my ideas are winners, okay? That's, that's my only point. This is a good example of that. Do you see how it goes from, like, 600 megs, and all of a sudden balloons to, like, 3 to 7 megs? We're downloading this one right now, by the way. So that's because I had that bright idea I was going to inject the ISO and make everything available everywhere. Right? So it's, it's automation. You work through it, and then you're like, oh, that wasn't the greatest idea I've ever had, so how do I... How do I make this flexible enough to be the same playbook locally and in the cloud? And, and there's ways to do it. So it's, uh, it's what I like about Git, though. I can work backwards in time and see all of my mistakes. Um, and also, sometimes that makes me really comfortable. How many people comment code out when you don't know what it does? Uh, I hate you because I come behind and I have no idea if that's important or not. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to uncomment this and run this when the system fails. I don't publish anything. <laughs> I, 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 I drive, I, like, I've, I've come across so much, and that, or dot might old. need it again in the future. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, he, he really must. And so <laughs> dot old, and dot old, too. And, like, those are really instructive, because you're, like. I at least do dot date. <laughs> well, the date's already on the file. You don't really need to well, add a date. that can be changed. As yeah, so you, you, you go along, and, like, sometimes the date on the files, and actually, there are so many problems with how we do version control when there's a conversion control system. It drives me insane to go through it. So I, I walk through, um, and with Git, I am, I am uh, very strict about saying if, if it's commented out code, we're deleting it. Like it's, it's just flat, it's going away. If it's not instructive to learn what you're trying to do, it's going away. So, and we'll, we'll look at my GitHub here too, and you guys can see how poorly how cool I do things. But do you just um, add the comments in the code then? Yeah, so you can, you can add the... Uh, because if you put it in the code, then you know what you commented well, out, or at the very top. I'm a, a comment out, and then three versions down the line, I suddenly need that again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me solve your problem. This is a good, oh, I love learning experiences, right? So hang, hang on a second. Let's, 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 let me show you why this is not the problem you think it is. That's true if I just have the file. But let's go in here. And so you're looking at this, right? And you're like, hey, this is where I'm at right now. And, like, and so, by the way, some of the stuff I talked about, I really did try to document. If you go to GitHub, um, you, will, you will see a lot of the stuff that I've talked about, where you can go for stuff. I will try to keep this updated as I go along. There's also up here in the uh, wiki where I was starting to do classes and I didn't quite get there. Um, but this, if you were to do this and you want to run against packet.com, it would totally work for you. But let's go back to your problem, because what if I do need something I comment out? And I'm also going to teach you why a commit will not solve a problem where you expose to pass through the world. I am going to hammer and hammer and hammer on people using API keys if they rotate regularly, because at some point you are going to commit something you didn't need to. You are going to commit a secret out into the world, and once it is committed, it is there forever. You can go back and purge it from the commit log, and that will help a little bit, but it's the internet, and people remember the internet. Archive.org remembers. <laughs> people remember. So, so you go back in time, and you're like, hey, you know what? I need to know. Here. Ha. Perfect. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about comments is, has anybody ever seen the XKCD where um, he's, he's got his comments listed, and he's like, my Git commits become significantly less useful the longer a project drags on? Because at first, he's got these really beautiful, hey, this is everything I did. And by the end, it's just one commit, another commit, more commits for the comments. Um, commenting is an art form. So in this particular instance, I know exactly what I did. If I needed this, there it is. I can go back again. I can do one of two things. I can go back into a program like this and just copy and paste it out, right? If you don't know anything about Git, and you're just, I'm going to use one master branch, and I'm just going to keep committing, and I'm not going to do anything different, I'm not going to do all the things that Git tells me to do, I just want some version control, I don't want to think about it. You can just walk back in time, and literally copy and paste it out, and now you have that, right? It exists. It's in that dot .git, but what's really, really important is not that it's not stored on your hard drive, it's that when I come in, and I look... at this vagrant file, I don't have anything left
ask me her and I'm wondering why on earth did you comment that out with her? What did you mean by that? What did you know? That is my selling point. Um, if you guys you can get from nothing else, please, it, it will make you code a lot better. You'll, you'll go through and you'll sit there and you'll go, hey, you know what, I'm confident I can get this back at any time. Um, if, any, if nobody's ever showed this to you, by the way, this is something I always try to do for people. Um, that may completely hose things. So, so I, have, uh, I have nothing unclean here. We won't do this here. I'm going to go to a different project just because I, I am. I have some binders in this right now. Uh, you guys ever seen the Streisand project? You guys want to see some uh, some cool ants, This is a this is a cool one. All goes another one. But if you ever want to set up your own VPN. It's, so the Streisand effect, if you've never heard of it before, is Barbara Streisand um, didn't want reporters to tell everybody where she lived. And so the Streisand effect is named after her because immediately everybody knew where she lived. So the idea is trying to make something go away and it's going to be louder. Uh, Streisand project, very, very cool. It's just a way to hit all these different cloud providers. So if you're ever sitting there and you're like, you know, I want to get started with Ansible and I want to get started with an interactive cloud provider, I don't really know how to start. Um, this is one of those projects that you could throw some stuff at the wall and just see how it turns out. Um, and it'll give you instructive guides that actually work so you can start rebasing. Like, I like to start code from there. I don't like to just figure it out for myself. Um, I want to start with somebody that has a working product so I can tweak it. I tend to get faster where I'm going when I do that. Um, so only because I need to set up a, a VPN server for this, I had that, that download. So if I go in here, there's a get status. Um, and get log dash in. Okay. So these are these are all the commits. And if you take a look in here, I can I can do this. Nothing left, except for dot .git or any of the hidden files, really. Everything in Git that is magical and makes Git Git happens in the dot .git directory, which means that I can get everything back. Anytime I want. That's fast. Git is powerful. Git will make your life better if you, want it. you don't have to use it all at the same time. Right? Just uh, get used to committing in a single branch. And then when you start learning how to branch, and you're like, I have this good idea, instead of making a copy of that directory and saying, I'm going to go try this good idea, and then I'm trying to figure out how to get back, Git will solve it all. Git, all Git does is figure out which lines are different things. And merge them back together. Git is a Git is a class worth taking. Again, the choice taking it. That um, and there's some really really good guides out there. So I know if you guys are not a big fan of GitHub being owned by Microsoft, and certainly if you're not a big fan of the uh, VirtualBox being run by Oracle, for example, like I, I get why these would be things for people. Um, Bitbucket. These guys do, um, the Atlassian guys, do a really, really, really nice, how do I, how do I get started? So they'll, they'll walk you through with nice pictures, and um, they, will, they will basically drive you through everything. And then there's definitely people out there that have done all of this. If you guys have never seen this before, Catacoda. Um, I strongly recommend Catacoda if you're trying to get started with stuff because this is how I'd like to see us do documentation. So this is like when you become a big boy in all this automation stuff, you can do some super cool stuff. And and this is one that I just thought was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So you drive into anything. Gets you a little little how to guide. <coughs> This is a normal bash. This is just a container that starts up over on the side. 
and you can walk through everything. If you want to just type in there and, and run and run commands, like it's it's just Linux, right? It's just a container. Um, but if you're walking through and you're like, hey, you know, okay, so it wants me to type this, you can hit the little button over here, and it'll walk you through stuff. It's live, and then if you're right in the middle of it, you're like, I've learned this other thing over here that's not part of this tutorial. I want to try it. It'll drive right back in. And then when you're done with it, it goes away. I mean, like, to me, especially in an ops team, you're trying to figure out how people do things. This would be super helpful. Because automation is really cool for making things happen magically. But if you're trying to learn why things work the way they do and get it under the hood, automation can move way too fast for you to understand what's truly being done. And so this is a really nice way to say, all right, so if you, if you want to understand what's actually going to happen, you should look at this aspect of the system during this portion of its running. And, and this would be a really, really cool concept. Um, that's, that's, one, that's one I hope people do. If you, guys, if you guys have never heard of the Python, the Jupyter Notebooks, um, Jupyter Notebooks are another approach to that. I strongly recommend because they, they essentially run a kernel. Yes, I would like to leave the page. Thank you for asking. So you can essentially run live code in the middle of uh, a notebook that you can actually document a bunch of stuff in. Um, Jupyter are very, very cool. If you're trying to learn Python especially, that's a, that's a great approach to it. Okay. In the meantime, hopefully, So, so this is one of those problems that you'll start to run into with things like uh, with things like Vagrant. I have three different providers, and I've been testing for so long on this machine at this point that I have networks all over the place. And what's happened is it's trying to take on a network that is already occupied by uh, VMware. So that doesn't often happen, but it, it does happen if you have been using it for a while. It starts to run around. You can change all of that in a Vagner file. Um, what I'm going to do for right now, just because I actually want to show you some stuff, and then we'll, I'll show you how to fix this. So I can specify any of the providers I build, right? So I can specify VirtualBox, I have that installed. Um, but I can also switch to any of the other ones that I want to use. And so we'll use VMware Desktop. And we won't use Vagrant Destroy because it's already destroyed. And so this is the cool part. This is what happens when you don't have to download. It's just local. It spins right up. Uh, it's going to sit here, and it's going to walk you through some different things that it's doing while it's, uh, it's waiting. And if I were to go over and look in the world of VMware again, you won't see it here. This is not running over here, so you actually do have to go in, scan for virtual machines. Here it is. If you want to look at it through the console. If that's not what you actually need to do, and for the most part, that's actually not what I need to do. I actually don't care about the console and most virtual machines I'm on. They're just servers to me. So Vagrant SSH is what we're actually going to use. Remember how I told you that we have the... Uh... So this is where it's doing... See, this is why Zero Tier is really kind of inconsistent for me. Exact same playbook. Exact same playbook. This time it worked. It just depends on the network connection. So sometimes I get much more reliable results when I take a different probe. Zero tier in particular has been like that for me. Zero tier likes to just kind of haunt me and, and do weird things. So what you can type is Vagrant SSH, and voila, you're in the system. If you're sitting there and you're like, you know what I really want to do? I really want to run one of my, my Ansible playbooks against this system. How on earth would I do that? So 
this has something called being our SSH config. And all this is going to do is say, how do I actually get to this bad boy? And so when you look through this, here's a couple of things I want to point out. If you guys have never seen a Vagrant SSH config file before, can everybody see this? All right. So it's going to start. It's going to say the host name is 127. It's the local host. It's going to go over to the user. It's going to go to port 2222. If you spin up <coughs> 10 Vagrant machines, they're all going to need a different port on that local adapter. So this is why this output of this file, rather than you manually figuring this out, is really important. There are also plugins that will do this for you. If what you really want to do is just run a ton of Ansible playbooks outside of Vagrant entirely, there are definitely plugins that will just build an inventory file for you so that you don't have to go through this headache. But if you want to do something that's truly SSH customized, I want to use SSH flags, I don't want to have to use Vagrant's version of how I SSH, then this is a really good solution for you. It's going to say user known host file. So these two are really, really, really important because what they will essentially say is I get that the known host for this IP is going to change all the freaking time because I'm building and destroying constantly. Do not add me to your known host file. I am not the sort of known host that you need to know forever. Password authentication, no. This just forces a pub key and this is where it goes for the identities. And then finally, that identities only line, that should hopefully look familiar, that keeps your SSH agent from acting up and saying, here's all the things I know about, why can't you use me? And then log a little fail. So how do I actually use this? Dash capital F, and then you need to provide a file to that configuration. So before you can do that, you probably need to do something like this. And it's going to run that command, output it into that file, and then go to SSH default and get it. And all I'm doing there is saying default because this box is called default. And if you want to Ansible into that box, you would have to do something like dash i default. You define an inventory on the line. If you've never done this before, defining an inventory on the line, you can do. If you have one host to get into and you only say default, it is going to look for a file called default to look for an inventory in that, and it will not work. Add a comma. That gives you one single host. I want to go to all of the hosts, which happens to be just that host, but you could type something like default as well there. Sorry. If I could type default, you could type that. Um, pain. <coughs> all right. So here's the magic. All of that works fine. You are not going to get in there. It has no idea how to get to that host. So Ansible has something called SSH common args. And this is where you could pass... that file, just like that. So that's how you use Ansible. And now here's what's really cool. That, that playbook that I'm having trouble with is zero tier, I am not running Packer every single time to try to modify that bad boy. Like that's just going to take forever. What I probably want to do is spin up the box I build in Vagrant and keep playing with it, keep rerunning it, and this is where I really want this repeatable environment that I can destroy and rebuild at any given time. So if I type Vagrant destroy, and I say, I think I've fixed my problem, I can get rid of that VM. It will power it down, bring it back up, and now I'm getting that exact same box, and I can do that one last test. Is there anything that I forgot I did that made this thing blow up? And if I can do that against here, and I can automate that process, I can also do it against Kimu, and I can also do it against VirtualBox, those are all automatable tests. Everything I've done so far has been on the command line. If I automate every single one of those tests, now I'm building environments that when you guys are actually there to do whatever it is you're there to do, you're not sitting there going, why does this thing not work? Why am I going back in time? You said zero tier work on here. It doesn't gonna work. So we can actually get towards the thing we're there to do. Repeatable environments are very, very, very helpful. 
So we'll bring that thing back up again. It builds. It runs. Now, if you guys are, are familiar with uh, process redirection, you may want to do something like a FIFO pipe. So what a FIFO pipe basically does is takes the output of the command and stores it in a, a file handle that things that can read files can work with. If that's what you want to do, more power to you. I've done this before. I've gotten inconsistent results with it. If you figure out whatever it is that I was just doing weird, awesome. Like I, like I said, it's, I'm, I'm totally not trying to discourage you. This is just not one of those things. And it also, like if you've ever done process redirection, it's typically a caret and then parentheses and then whatever actual um, command you want to run to feed into that file command. And that thing has never worked for me for SSH. I do not believe you can do process redirection. Some things it'll do just fine. I, I just SSH does not seem to work. <coughs> so I try to find a better way than just writing it to a file called SSH config. And at the end of the day, SSH config was just the easiest thing I did. Um, once again, if I come back through here and I run that, and then I run that, I get connectivity. And and what's cat? What's important is that all stays the same, but there is something that changed, and that was the identity file. Every single time Vagrant starts off, it changes that identity file. <coughs> so, so that's a that's a single machine. You can do a multiple machine. We'll take a look at a Vagrant file right now. So this is a Vagrant file. They're pretty simple. All I'm saying is go out and get this box. And it's going to go out to Vagrant, and it's going to pull that box down. If you don't want to go to the Vagrant cloud, you're doing stuff locally, you can add a box locally, Vagrant box add. You don't have to go out to that. Um, you can also put just any web address in there. So if you have a local server, and that's where your Vagrant boxes are, that will work. You can either put the actual box file itself there, and it will download, and it'll work just fine. Or you can go out and you can put what's called a manifest file. And manifest files are really cool if you're going to version your boxes and you always want to go grab the latest version. Um, you can actually get in there and say, hey, um, the latest version on that manifest file that it's going to look at is 0.4, so go download the 0.4 um, version of this box. But if people want to be able to work back in time, they could also say, no, I really want version 0.3. That was something that I, I had that had something I needed. Um, this. We'll do a synced folder. So one of the things Vagrant does, particularly for the developers, anything in that um, directory where the Vagrant file is will sync into the box. So that was really good for web developers that were trying to just, they just want to keep a copy of their website in that directory, and then it would start off and it would run a web server form, just kind of work. Um, I generally don't need that, so I disable it. And then this is where I can actually specify a static IP. So a lot of the server type things we do, we actually want a static IP. So if you take this and put it on a different server and you want to make sure you specify that, you can do that as well. Um, this right here, that VHV enable, that's where I set nested virtualization so I can support libvirt if I want to. The problem I'm going to have with VirtualBox there is VirtualBox doesn't support nested virtualization. So there's so getting free and simple and well supported, it's always kind of a crapshoot. You a lot of times you have to choose a really specific thing, specific thing you want to do. Same thing for here, libvirt nested, we'll do true. And then finally, I want to run an Ansible playbook. And that's, and that's all that is. So, so that's that aspect of it. So we, the one thing that I have not showed you guys yet is zero tier. <coughs> OK. Poof, I'm zero tier. Zero tier is really, really, really cool. So I'll show you. This is my secure WV. I don't have any devices that have joined this network yet. So let's join the network. Here's what I need. That right there. going to 
SSH on my box. Um, remember, like most of the time, I just honestly don't care. I, I don't need to be um, have a have a console. I want a console window. If I, you can spin up GUIs and stuff in this. That's why you want a console window. So if you were spinning up like Windows or something, totally get why you'd want a console. Um, it will automatically create VNC sessions for you if you want to, RDP sessions for you. But you don't need it. And see if zero tier is installed. Super. So you also have default passwordless sudo on a Vagrant box. So you can sudo as, as you desire. Um, because again, they're not meant to last forever. If you want any of those parameters to change, they are changeable. I can see how you would not want a server that you maybe control with vSphere or uh, with Vagrant to, to exist with a default password. I can see how that would be a problem for you. All I need to do is type zero tier CLI join and the network ID and poof. And what you will see happen is I now have an adapter to that network. And on that adapter, I have things that Linux network adapters have, like a MAC address. I come back over to zero tier, and one device has joined this network. Here it is. This is my device. I click the check mark, it is now authorized on the network. It now has network connectivity on this network, and it will go through and it's going to auto assign an IP address. So we'll give it a second to decide how it wants to do that. Here we go, I have an IP address of 172. I go back to my box and wouldn't you know it, I have an IP address here. This is a static IP now. Here's what's super cool about this. We're going to go build something somewhere else in the cloud and we're going to have them talk to each other. Right? So that's the first step of this, right? This is probably one of the biggest problems I've ever seen anybody have with trying to bridge different places. Like they're like, my buddy has stuff and I have stuff and I just want them to talk to each other behind that and I don't know how to make OpenVPN talk and this is flat out the easiest way I've ever seen this work. You, you go, you go to download, that uh, There we go. That curl statement, that's where it comes from. Like, I, I didn't make that up. This, the curl statement's actually really cool. It's doing this uh, PGP verification. Um, but if you are not that person and you just don't really care, you could do this. But I'm telling you all that's really happening when it pulls that script and it figures out what OS it's going to install against, installs a repo file, installs a package. I mean, it's, that's, that's something you can get by. You don't have to do it like that. They install it. And then you can watch the type zero tier joint. That was all there was to it. So, let's open up another shell. SSH. Sweet. What do not I want to do? Now I have to change my packet API. I'm not going to do that. Um, now what I want to do is this. <coughs> Why do you think that will save? So we're going to exit this thing for a second. I just want to see if I can. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so this is a packet.net server that I've, I've built out in the cloud. This is a bare metal server. Uh, if you guys want to see it, it's right here. These cost about 40 cents an hour. However, Here's what's cool about Packet. Packet has a variety of a uh, has a variety of servers. Now what I really want is I don't want your pricing. Want your server, maybe I see pricing. Oh, here we go. So if you are after Oh, God. 
that's not at all. Although that's... You guys got it? Experiment okay? Okay. This is what I was after. Here we go. These are the different servers they offer. So they offer these. This is the one I'm using right now for 40 cents an hour. But if you needed something bigger, you can do that for a couple bucks an hour. And so you can see how this would be really useful if you were doing something on a Saturday and then you want to get rid of it at the end. They have that, and then they also, if you saw, they have the spot market. And so the spot market, so you're, you're reserved basically instead of paying per hour, you can, they can uh, discount it off for you. And then the spot market is where you go in and they say, if nobody is using our capacity, I would much rather you use our capacity and get willing to be, be willing to get booted than to just have it sit there making us no money. So the spot market is one of those places where now it's 25 cents an hour. I don't know what it's cost right now. We can, we can go pull that if you want to see it. But basically the, the gist is, if you only need it for an hour, you can kind of play the odds that nobody's going to boot you off, and if your automation is good enough, you might not care anyways. So, I, I like Packet. They're not the only cloud provider that does this. There's a lot of cloud providers out there. They all they all do different things. But I'm I'm a fan of I'm a fan of Packet. Um, if you were going the other direction, and you're like, you know what? I want to try some cloud. I don't have the money to do it. Go to Google. Google is offering three hundred dollars of credit towards their services, and it's good for a year. You can do a lot with $300 on Google Cloud. And Google Cloud supports nested virtualization if you just want to build really big instances and use them like hypervisors. Like, there's totally a bunch of stuff you can do there. Um, so, <coughs> in any event, I'm going to go off to, to this server. So you'll see, again, I'm using this known host and strict key because this is a, a temporary server I don't want to have forever. And I'm going to go ahead and take a look. I don't know if I installed zero tier. I do not believe I did out here. Sweet, I didn't. So I'll just come back up here and go into my home lab and go over to Wiki and the uh, provisional machine with packet hosts. That was a piece that I did. Earlier. No, I, I know where I stored this. I stored this somewhere. So we'll go back over to downloads. And I'm feeling dangerous. We will install zero tier. Like I said, it's literally just doing that. It's not, not done anything crazy. And then zero tier CLI join. sitting here, and it will uh, kind of hum along for a little while, um, and then you'll eventually see this thing join the network. So, what's really cool about all of this as you go along, you see how I authorize that? Um, so you can, uh, first of all, it's all scriptable, you can hit the API for all of this. The other super cool, there's my, there's my server, let's authorize it. What I was going to do was give you guys all a Vagrant box, and then you could have done, brought it up, and it would run that script to join automatically, and then we could have authorized, and you could have all talked to each other, and then the uh, the next step would have been to go down and actually show you some rules. So I'll show you where the rules are, which won't get to it today. So if on my Vagrant box I can make it over here. About 36 milliseconds, and that's that's natively inside of zero tier. And what's super cool about all of that is I can reach back into my home network and do that. I can reach back just about anywhere, which is kind of useful right now for me because I have not touched these guys in a little while. We'll see if they still exist. We're playing a CTF here right now. Um, 
and I did not want to be constrained by minor little details like, am I actually in the room? So once we own the server, we put zero chair on there. Um, so if you see this command right here, clean that up a little bit. Size this should in theory work. I do not know that we were actually. Oh, never mind. It did work. This is the lethal weapon server in the uh, CTF right now. Uh, and right now, it looks like we have uh, some folks on there we don't really want to be on there. So, 60. So, do I have. Our TCP kill on there right now. So, if I'm sitting down there and I'm like, you know what? You guys are really misbehaving. I don't want you on there. together, 
you can see, I, I can tell you some of the stuff you've seen here today took me days to figure out. Like I was just banging my head on why this particular kernel didn't work, that didn't work. But you get into an environment, especially an environment that's contested, and if your automation is where it needs to be and it's flexible enough to deal with a problem, <coughs> you can throw stuff down quick and you're beating everybody else by a mile that is trying to manage to get stuff. CTF is cool because on CTF, as soon as you get root, as soon as you get a user access to say nothing to root, you want to stop people from following you in. So there's that aspect of it. So I, I, I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and then the cool thing is, let's say one of these boxes gets compromised. I don't trust these guys. Um, we let them have root on this box so we could watch what they were doing. They don't have access to my network anymore. It is that easy to blow them away. If I train this entire thing and you know we're here for a weekend, I'm going to destroy this network when I get done. Like It's just going to go away. I don't need it anymore. Here's what's really cool. That is just your standard VPN. I haven't done anything you can't do with your standard VPN by doing that. This is the powerhouse right here. This is what makes, I think, zero tier something that's so incredible. Because with this, I can start defining how traffic crosses the network. And so, you can say that if it is not IPv4, if it is not an ARC request, and if it is not IPv6, drop it. Somebody sends malformed packs across your network that don't perform, drop it. If you don't want anybody to come through that are not on that those networks that you issued, they try to add another IP on there and start their own network, you can drop them. And then you can say accept anything else. It works basically like a firewall rule. First, uh, first match wins. And so what's, what's really, really, really cool about this is you can choose to do different actions. And once you, uh, what you can do, drop, accept, redirect, and T are the powerhouses that make this so useful from a security standpoint. Accept and drop. So first of all, what I can do is I can say anybody trying to go over anything but 422, just drop it. Anybody trying to get to 4443, accept it. What's very cool about that is I can categorize stuff. I can say anybody that is these hosts in this network, you guys are all clients. You can't talk to each other at all. If I can say drop for anybody tag client. So client can't talk to client. I can say accept to servers, but only the servers they should be listening on, like 443. So I can say I could have them all on the same layer 2 network and do layer 3 firewalling. And what's very important about that is we've always been able to do that at the host level. With this, you can do it outside of that host that may have gotten compromised. So now you have that two-way trust. If this gets compromised, your host firewalls should stand up. If your host firewalls get compromised, this should stand up. They have to hit both to get that communication working. That's really cool to me. You can do that with OpenB switch, by the way, too. Here's the two, and you can also do these with OpenB switch. T, again, if I just want to stand back and I want to watch what's going on in that <coughs> network, um, T will let me monitor all of the traffic. If I had wanted to, and I, we, we may do this later today just for fun, because this, the CTF here is really cool. We're, uh, we're just kind of chilling out and, and doing some stuff, so they've worked on some like reverse shells and, and showing us how to do it. We've uh, We've done some stuff like TCP kill and showing them what we did. Um, it's, it's a very laid back atmosphere. I could force all of the native traffic out over this and then tee off the traffic and I could sniff literally everything that happens on that network. That is a way for me to kind of inject packets sniffing down because of where these things exist. I've just owned enough boxes for that to happen. And then finally, you can actually do that redirect. So if I wanted to, I could put snort in the line as an IPS and, present, and prevent them from doing anything that is going to trigger a snort rule. So even if they wanted to, even if they had like, even if one of the web servers was compromised, that would give me a chance to block any attempt to compromise the server with a known exploit that snort knows about. Those are really, really cool things to me. So we won't get into doing those right now. The, those I have not played with extensively. We'd be here for a little while. 
But that is zero tier. I strongly, strongly recommend you check it out. I think it's really cool. And that it brings us to pretty much the end of what I had to talk about. So anybody has any questions? Sweet. Is that flow? Oh, right, right over here? Yeah, the flow rules. Is that canned or did you add some of that yourself? No, th this is all canned. This is, this is by default what comes. Their documentation is, is pretty good. So one of the things I should show you, there does exist an API for this, so a lot of the stuff I'm manually doing. One of the things I really want to do to happen when something joins is I want to know what it is. I want to have a short name for it so I can, like generally my networks aren't big enough that I just have mysterious devices out there. A lot of ways to do that. So this is one of those places where service discovery becomes very, very cool. Because what I probably don't want to do is give an auth token out to the world. But let's say I wanted you to all join my network. I could have console sitting there and saying, yes, I see this thing coming into my network. And it starts populating its key value store. And I could have every single one of those boxes just talk up to console. right? Like I don't need authentication for that. I could just report back. Um, some basic health check stuff, and then out of pounds, I like to rip down a short description and jam in there and use the auth somewhere else. Um, those are all embedded, and then you can do this all with the API, so you can basically change all the stuff in the API. You can also share these networks. Any other zero-tier user can use it. Or if you want to self-host this whole thing, that's also possible. Basically, every single one of their, uh, their networks is its own API controller. Um, so it depends on how clever you want to get. But if what you really want to dig into was... Uh, they do also have, I'll show you this, ah, I'll show you this if I don't delete it. Uh, they do also have a matter most community. So if you have a question, um, let's see if I actually got back there earlier. Yeah, that's right. uh, no, I would not like to do that. Let's go to the actual, here. So if you want to see some cool examples of stuff, th those are all canned, <coughs> um, but they will. Really? This, that's the moment in time you're going to have a problem, yeah? One of you is what I'm actually looking for here. Um, by the way, these are the, the, these are the examples of the tags um, to basically say how they want stuff to to go across. So you can basically say when the tags aren't the same, you can you can cross between those. Um, these are those examples that you've seen before, so they'll give you some examples of how to actually use this stuff. And the cool part is all the way down it's come on, you're here. You're here, I know you're here. You know a smart man? There we go. So these are all examples of, uh, of design patterns. Um, these little design patterns. So they have a they have their whitelisting to say, hey, these are specifically uh, what they want to happen. So they they say unless you already have an existing session, you can't start a new one. Um, and they evaluate from top down, so you can see where you might want to mix that in. You might want to say, hey, I've authorized port 22. I've also authorized existing sessions in case something has reached back out. How has this existing chatter back and forth? There is this example, though. And so this is literally what they do. If you want to do that to uh, get copies of all the traffic, T, and then dead beef 11 here is just a zero tier address. So if you guys saw the EFC over here, one of those, that's a, that's a zero tier address. You just pipe it in there and say, hey, this is what I want. You can put more than one adapter on there. Um, most network sensors don't generally have an IP, so you say, I want an IP on this so it doesn't get confused with traffic destined to that host otherwise. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's it. And then one of the things they do to trim things down is you can say, I just want the first 128 bytes of every packet. So if I just want like the header information, that's pretty much that's going to cover it. Some simple stuff. Anybody else? Alright, I've, I've talked at you for a while, it's, uh, it's almost noon.
new, and if you guys are trying anything and you'd like me to, to look at something, or, or just show me something that you, that you've seen, I'm, uh, I'm available to do that. Or if you want to go get lunch, I would totally understand why. I'll be around all weekend, um, mostly over in the CTF area, wandering about. Damn, I'm a bald guy. Sometimes I do wear a hat. Sometimes I do wear my hat. Because it gets chilly. Sweet. Thanks, guys. I need a shim. I need a shim. He wants to ship. It was. Uh, see, originally I was sitting down. Don't be a stop this first. They, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, so hey, 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 h